We were more like brothers looking out for each other, hung together through thick and thin. Podcast World with Shaken. I'm Chad. Back at you. Another episode of the Foul Eye Podcast. Yukonuba Duck Dogs series fueled by the one and only Yukonuba. The new sport diet is what we're feeding Axel and Duff and Waylon and Slash and Mo, our dogs all the way across the country from Georgia to Minnesota to the West Coast. We just had an unbelievable trip to California. Axel was on fire. Ducks of widgeon variety, pintails and mallards. Speckle belly geese, even a few Canada cacklers, he performed miraculously. It's amazing for me to see how these dogs attack this diet. I'm not kidding you when I say I can hear Axel eating from two to three hundred yards away if the wind is right. He sounds like a lion on a zebra. He's he, they just attack it. There's no tiptoeing around it. There's no pussyfooting around it. When the food is in the bowl and it's go time, they eat and they don't ask any questions. The diet is awesome. The dogs are loving it they're healthy their energy levels are up and um, I'm talking about keeping weight on a dog through this time of year when our weather conditions are starting to get really cold um, it's all we ask for and Yukonuba delivers again so check them out all their premium foods Yukonuba is a strong supporter of the outdoor lifestyle the hunter the provider <clears throat> and that's why we believe in the Yukonuba brand so please continue to support the partners and sponsors that support us here at the Foul Life and Bandit and all of our brands and TV and podcasting and manufacturing thank you all so much for doing so and thank you all so much for being here today and subscribing to the Foul Life Podcast, part of the This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast family. My guest today is a badass. He is a police officer. He is a detective. He's a sergeant. He runs K-9. He has a Doberman pincher named Duke that is famous. I met this man in Las Vegas at the SHOT Show at a little soiree that we threw with you, Canuba. Sergeant Ed Soares, how are you, my man? Hey, Chad. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a complete honor to be on here with you. It's an honor to have you on here, man. I see that blue line behind you. We're total supporters of the blue line. What... Um, when you think about your job right now, your livelihood, there's a lot of stuff in the news today about law enforcement. Would you be as apt to become a law enforcement officer? Uh, you, you serve our community. You are, you are a server of the people. Um, would you be just as apt and, and fired up to become a police officer if you were just starting today with what's going on in the media and the news as you were when you started back how long have you been about are you 20 year veteran now going on my 20th year yes 20th year would you be just as excited to become a police officer today ed 100 percent um my son who's 22 is currently in the police academy um and i give him all the props for for going through as a young man today with the atmosphere and temperature of our nation and and how the police are being treated, you know, from coast to coast, but it takes a certain person to come into law enforcement. Uh, we don't do it for um, money. That's for sure. And we don't do it for recognition. If there's a, there's a little fire that burns in all of us that just wants to, I don't want to sound cliche or, you know, the, the words have been used so many times, but it's, it's a calling and it's something that we yearn to help other people uh, other than ourselves. And 100%, I would still do it. If I was coming in as a rookie today and going through the academy, I still feel every day that I come to work, uh, if I can at least help one person or, or, or assist some kid in, in going in the right path, I still love to come to work. Um, do there, are there days that, you know, you get down and, and, and because you've seen something on the news or, or a cop stepped out of line and now we're paying for it. Um, but still, I would absolutely 100% do my job um if i was just a rookie absolutely and i wouldn't uh, advise my son to be a police officer and i didn't feel that way you know i tell him to be a fireman a fireman there's good money in fire the scheduling is pretty nice there's da there's danger in being a firefighter for yeah, sure 100%. i just think as a police officer with the mindset that you have to have um in today's world is not i don't i don't know if it's just the bad guys that are after police officers and that's what i don't like and that's when you hear people talking about you know the blue line and how to defund the police and we need this it's just like i shake my head and i'm like man i don't 
I don't understand what you think is going to happen with that analogy or that outcome of taking away the people that are at our beck and call when we need them. And I'm talking from a flat tire. If a, if a 75 year old lady has a flat tire, it's a police officer that first stops and puts his sirens on and, or her sirens on and helps out. And, and then you just elevate from there. You could just imagine how many different levels there are of danger in your guys' jobs. Um, what are your thoughts on on the you know there was cops at one time bad boys bad boys what you can do and people could get kind of an inside look at a, a lie on duty police officer male or female running the beat but now it seems you know before covid you had this live pd show that was blowing up um is that good to show cops in the right light? Because every time I would watch it and I, I, I self admittingly, I'd watch it cause I'm interested in what y'all do. Like I still want to go on ride alongs. I want to get cleared to go on ride alongs and see what you guys do. I'm in, I'm really intrigued by it, Ed. Um, is that good for society? Is it, uh, I, I don't like that they took that off the air. I thought it was doing a good job of showing law enforcement in the right light of how they help leaders, how they communicate, how they're active in the communities. I understand that there are, that's what you guys are here for is to, a part of your job is to prevent crime and to stop crime and catch bad guys. I didn't see anything wrong with showing that. If you choose to be a bad guy or a quote unquote criminal, then you're going to get in trouble. You need to pay the price. That's how it's always been. It, back in the old days, you would get hung in the middle of the street. You would get shot. You would, it was an eye for an eye for a lot of our history. Now it's not like that, even though I do have different opinions and feelings on that, starting at an early, if you're starting to get in trouble early, I think that the, the, the consequences should be much bigger personally, because I think that would maybe prevent people from escalating. I don't know how you feel about that, but I'm, I'm getting long winded, Ed, but do you think that those are good shows to show the value of police officers and police departments as a whole? Absolutely. Um, for years, we, and law enforcement, when I say we, we uh, encompassing all law enforcement, there was, you know, that veil between what we do in the public and what cops did and uh, live PD is, you know, take down that veil. And what I'm 100% in support of being transparent and letting the citizens know what we do on a day to day basis. I mean, there's, we're approaching over a million cops in America now, and every day, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of contacts, good contacts that police have with citizens that that majority of the, the populace will never know about. You know, they'll, they'll never know about that cop that helped a special needs kid or they helped deliver a baby or whatever, whatever good contact they, they did that day. It will go unrecognized and unseen. And what that those shows do is they, they take that veil out of tra- uh, and be transparent to where they can see the public can see what we do on a daily basis, you know, and, you know, they harp on you from the Academy to, you know, when you retire, our job can be 90% boring all day where you're doing absolutely nothing to the blink of an eye where you're in a foot pursuit, you're in a shooting, you know, you're fighting a, a, a combative subject or you're delivering a baby. Who knows? You, you never know what you're going to do or encounter when you come into work. And for the average Joe or the citizen to see that, it, it can open their eyes and see that, you know, we're not robots. We're not, we're not out there just enforcing the law, enforcing the law. You know, we have a lot of gray area that we can work into that we, you know, we don't always have to arrest the, the bad guy. If we see another need that we can help them out, or we don't even have to, you know, harp on that kid that didn't go to school. We can go another route. You know, police officers are just like, you, Chad, they're just like anybody else. You know, we have good days, we have bad days. You know, when we cut, we bleed. And the citizens, I believe, need to see that. And if you take things like that off the air, where's the transparency? Where, how are you going to see what we, we do? People scream and holler that they want to know what the police do. They want, you know, justification. They want, well, if you don't, if you take that off the air, how's the regular public going to know? You know, we need to be transparent to where the citizens know what we do every day. Yeah, because there's always that thought process that goes through a general person's mind when you hear a siren or see a police officer with a siren on or an ambulance or a fire truck. Like, what's going on? You know, it's it's always been that's been said in our society for a long time that, you know, 
you're driving by an accident or somebody's pulled over everybody's like oh it's a tr-. you know everybody wants to see the train wreck everybody wants to know what happened everybody wants to see if somebody's getting a sobriety test we're all so inquisitive so they bring it to us and they let us see it in the comfort of our living room and you made a good point there it's almost like a like baseball and i'm not comparing the danger of baseball but baseball is like your heart rate's real low and you're just sitting there and there's nothing going on and then all of a sudden a guy hits a missile right at you and you got to react so you're sitting there in your car and you're on beat and you're like nothing's going on it's a quiet day and boom in a matter of milliseconds shit can go away and you got to be ready you're now your your adrenaline's going your focus is there everything that you've learned in your training your skill set starts to be put in place your communication efforts and your networking efforts with your fellow officers and your sergeant and your dispatcher maybe you got to call out fire maybe you got to call another help maybe you got to call in SWAT there's all these moving pieces that now it's go time and before you were just sitting there you might have been at lunch at a subway just chilling for a second grabbing a quick sandwich and boom you got to drop it where you took your last bite and you're gone so that's the thing that that show was showing me is that man at any given time this normal dude or this normal lady is just chilling got kids at home normal family guy and bam and now you know you take it you know your level of being a a, 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 you know an investigator and 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 things that you do now um i watch the first 48 religiously and i see these normal guys that are just normal hunters ranchers cattle owners dog owners husbands dads and you know and there's females that do it too their wives and mothers and they got to go in and they see this body and the and, and the and the whole deal is like is that really as easy as they make it look? No, man. You These guys are 40 years old and they're stressed out as heck. They're not sleeping. They're on caffeine like crazy. They're smoking cigarettes like they're going out of style. This is what my this is what I'm seeing, Ed. It's like I'm viewing these cops and these investigators in a light of like, man, they're just normal people. But when it's go time and they're like trying to enjoy a barbecue with their family and somebody gets killed in a murder and now there's an investigation, they're gone. They got to go and, and take care of it, just like what you do in your job. And I, I, that's what I was love about these shows is that it puts you guys in a light of like, man, y'all are just normal citizens that are protecting normal citizens. And when it's go time, we get to sit there and not go and you guys have to go. And that's that's a huge responsibility. And it's it's you know, it it can screw with your your adrenal glands. I mean, you you get. After a certain time, you, you'll get desensitized to dead bodies and, and mangled bodies and things like that. And, you know, it, it's I don't think it, it's normal to do that, but it's just a coping mechanism that we deal with, you know, after so many years, you know, and to, to hit on your point where, you know, you can be having a, a chill day or doing a report and then something happens. I mean, just recently in the news, um, I'm sure you've heard about it, the two L.A. County deputies that were just sitting in their patrol car and someone came up and, and shot both of them. Um, they were just targeted for wearing a uniform. Um, I believe they were fairly new, under, both under two years uh, on the job, and some knucklehead comes up and, and, and starts shooting into the patrol car, you know, and, and they were just, whatever they were doing, talking about family, you know, they had, you know, the female had kids. Uh, she got out, um, took extensive damage from the gunshot wound. So did her partner and she got out. And what did she do? You know, as a, as a, as a warrior female from LA County, she got out, got to a position of cover, took her partner and started rendering aid to him. Didn't matter that she was shot in the face, um, bleeding severely. She rendered aid to her partner. Now, if that doesn't show the mindset of not only police officers throughout the United States, But even as a, as a female, I give her so much credit. Um, You know, this job is just not a male job. It's she, she, in my perspective and in my view, she was a 100% warrior. She rocked it that day. And that, and that's what can happen in your job. You know, just sitting down, having dinner and it's go time and and you, and you rely on your training. Yeah. And it's, there's a lot of people in the in the workforce in America Ed in the world that rely on their training. But when you start putting in 
elements of gunfire and combativeness and uh, going on the defense and taking cover and adrenaline and fright and scare and knowing that your family is waiting for you at home. There's there, there there's something way more about being a police officer that I that our world needs to understand is, that it's not what the police academy guys made it look like back in the 80s and early 90s. This is a, a really, really uh, responsible and um, li- a lifestyle that is not to be taken lightly or taken for granted because like you said it could I've seen so many instances that it can be gone in a heartbeat and it's not that all of us don't put our bodies in harm's way every day by getting in a motor vehicle or getting on a motorcycle or climbing a tree or wakeboarding okay we choose to do this stuff as activities we choose to go and put ourselves in that we got to be careful we got to be honest we have to be focused we have to be responsible drivers don't you don't have there's so many things that i see as i mature in life of like why did I ever do that? Why did people continue to do this? Why are we in a hurry? There's road rage out there that blows my mind of, of just people like think that because they're going 70 and a 55, that they're going to get somewhere so much faster than me, but they don't understand all of the, all of the levels of difficulty and danger that they are executing right, right now. Like it, it's just putting so many people in harm's way. And I sit there and go, God, I wish there was a cop every five feet to teach these people. Like, dude, I understand that we're going to make mistakes but man we 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 are doing this blatantly and so there's all these different levels that we put ourselves in but we choose to you guys are you take on the responsibility and you choose to become an officer of the law you know what comes with that but then there's always the element of surprise and maybe there isn't anything that surprises ed soars today with 20 years on the on, the, on service in service of police department work but there is something that could happen today that you'd be, oh my gosh, I got to apply this skill set. Oh man, I got to apply this. I got to, I got to apply my breathing, my heart rate. I got to get my pistol out. I got to take aim. Now my heart rate's up. My adrenaline's going. I'm shaking a little bit. I'm in close counters. We have somebody that we're in a backyard. It's nighttime. They might be hiding underneath this bag of leaves or this in this shed right here. They could come out full blazing at any time and it could get Western in a heartbeat. So when you think about it, there's not much more of a danger, dangerous job out there you can joke around and say that a redhead roofing in august is a dangerous job because of the sun and the danger of falling off the roof i get that but i don't think that people understand and maybe i'm maybe i'm immature or premature by saying that but i think we need to do a better job as a country and, and communities of showing dude this is dangerous and what these guys do is protecting us so why is this even a conversation i, I wanted to start with that today because i wanted to make sure that people understand the respect that we have for the blue line our police department our public servants emts and firefighters and police officers and dispatchers and we take it for granted when we're in the sanctity and the safety of our couch and our home and our bed and our pillow and our kids are safe behind a locked door with an adt alarm on it but things can go array and that's when we depend on people like you so thank you for what you do and i'm glad that you're here today my man i appreciate your support thank you so you canuba is in my world i'm a duck hunter and i have duck dogs i have axel laying here with me right now and he's a lab a, a black labrador retriever but they also support canine and and police dogs and military dogs and this diet is helping you talk about responsibility now my dog is responsible for bringing back a dead duck your dog will go attack a criminal to keep you safe or to or to or to find one or to smell one out sniff one out they run them down they put themselves in harm's way all of the time um tell me a little bit about let's start with this tell me where where how your career is elevated in 20 years and then let's get into where canine came in and where duke came into the picture is, is duke about seven years old now eight years uh, old now? He, he's five and a half he's five, he's five and a half right now okay so the most current article they just did on you in working dog magazine that's current yes <clears throat> okay <clears throat> I want to talk about that article a little bit but let's start with your career real quick and just how you started and how you got to where you are now Oh, man. So I started in a city that borders Menlo Park called East Palo Alto. It's two and a half square miles. Um, just to give you kind of a mindset of what kind of city it was, it was voted, uh, voted or murder capital of the world in 1992. It's, it's basically like a, a small Oakland or a small L.A., very uh, 
a lot of populace of gangs and, and drug dealing and, and a lot of killings. So I did my first eight years, eight, nine years there, and then came over to Menlo Park. Majority of my career, I've worked uh, gangs and narcotics. Um, I've been and currently still are on the FBI uh, gang task force. Um, we've done numerous uh, undercover operations. Uh, me and my partner, Eric Callens, who works for, for Menlo Park, uh, we worked with uh, FBI. We did two large scale takedowns. Uh, I've been uh, a beat cop. I've been a field training officer. I've been a, a detective. I've been a gang officer. I've been a narcotic officer. Um, came to Menlo Park, uh, was a patrolman, went to detectives, and then got promoted as a sergeant in 2011. Uh, did patrol maybe four or five years and then got put in. I was the supervisor of our special investigations unit, which is basically a narcotic street team. And I also supervise our general investigations. Um, Duke came into play uh, 2016. I bought him as my personal dog uh, at eight weeks old from West Coast Dobermans. He's a, he's a San Jose, California dog with no intentions to be a cane officer. My son had gone off recently to play ball at University of Redlands down south and um, had the empty nest syndrome, bought an eight month or eight uh, week old puppy and brought him home. Around five, six months old, I brought him to PD. He uh, had a meeting to go to and the chief at the time, Bob Johnson, was in his office and asked where my dog was. I said, well, I have him crated in my truck. He says, hell no. Bring him inside. I'll puppy sit for you. And so I did. Meeting lasted about two hours long. Came back out. And Duke was, little Duke was asleep underneath his his, uh, his desk when the chief's typing away. And there was shredded cardboard all over the place. And four little suspicious wet spots where Duke had peed in my boss's office. So, you know, nervous. Kind of made a joke. Hey, sorry, chief. You know, wouldn't that be funny if you were the canine officer one day? And we'd have a funny story and kind of cock his head to the side and says, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to that. So that right there just dropped a little seed in my mind that, you know, I started training with the, with the company out of Santa Clara Bay Area Canine. We did uh, start doing scent work, obedient work. Um, and in 2016, June of 2016, it was ratified to make Duke an official canine for uh, Menlo Park Police. And he's a, he's a single purpose dog. Uh, just narcotics, so he's not apprehension, um, and it just it, it kind of grew from there. And the caveat to that is, up to the date of where Duke was uh, incorporated as a cannon officer in Miller Park, I was that officer that didn't like my picture taken. I didn't like talking to people. Um, all I wanted to do was work gangs and dope and, and work UC and and not have to deal with the, the nice part of the community. I just wanted to deal with, with the, with the dirt bags and put them in jail and, and uh, go after them. And I hated public speaking. I hated uh, getting in front of the camera. And uh, at the time the chief said, well, I'm kind of apprehensive to give a Doberman that has its own reputation to a guy that's six, four, 250 pounds with, sleeve tattoos. He's like, what kind of image is that going to show the, you know, the community? So he gave me a, pro a project that lasted six months long. He says, you're on probation for six months. You have to go to every elementary school in our jurisdiction and do a class and let them, let the citizens know what, what you're doing with Duke and let the kids see them. And then you got to do some other speaking. And, and I sat back in my chair. I'm like, holy crap, maybe I don't want a dog that bad to do this. But I saw the need for a dope dog. We didn't have one in our PD, so I saw the need. I said, okay, I'll suck it up for six months, you know, and, and do this. And then after six months, I won't ever have to talk to anybody again. I'll go back to doing what I, I like to do. Well, Chad, after the first time I went to a pre-K and I went with our school resource officer, she set it up and I went in there and here's, you know, there's 25, 30 screaming kids. I'm going, oh, Lord, what did I get myself into? After 20 minutes of me bumbling through a speech that I had prepared, uh, these kids started asking questions. I mean, great questions for, for kids. And, and I started answering them and, and we got a little rapport and I got to, to actually interact with these kids. Something changed in me to where I was like, you know what? Hell, this is kind of fun. 
So I started doing it more. And then that, after that six months was done, I started going out of our jurisdiction and doing classes for, you know, at hospitals, at the VA, at other elementary schools, you know, at, at festivities for, for other companies. And it just grew into a, a place to where now I'm completely comfortable talking in front of you. I would have never been able to do this, you know, four and a half years ago. Um, he brought me out, you know, my chief uh, always would, would joke that he was my therapy dog, that he brought me out of my shell and kept me from going in that, you know, that negative direction that sometimes cops can get into to where they get pigeonholed in gangs and narcs and, and they, they go through that little dark spot to where they alienate themselves from everybody else and they just want to do their job and don't want to see the bright side of law enforcement. Well, that was an avenue that I was going down. And I always credit Duke and my chief and everybody that helped me um, ratify him. That You know, it wasn't just me. I had commanders and sergeants at the time and chiefs helping me prepare and get ready for to do this. So, you know, there's so many people I could thank for that. But Duke gets 100% of the credit for bringing me out of a dark place, uh, uh, going down the road that, you know, would have led to probably, you know, me burning out. And he, he brought me out of that. And here I am. I, I've traveled all around the United States and done different conferences. I've got, you know, been able to go with Yukonu, but different places. It just brought me out and, and opened up a whole new life for me. So that in a nutshell is, is how Duke came to be. And so Duke's not only a canine narcotics dog, <clears throat> he's kind of a, a, he's your best friend he's therapy for you and he's become kind of a motivational life coach of getting you into this new role in life um to where now you are comfortable speaking um your six foot four 250 pounds would be considered a big large muscular human being like that's a stout dude like maybe like an nfl tight end body but <clears throat> intimidating could be one word to describe somebody be like that but in your role now you're soft on the side of speaking to a kindergarten class but you still got to be hard right you still got to have that mindset when you're in there with the gangs and the crips and the bloods and the and the vatos and all of these different gangs that roll the streets of california so how do you how do you turn it off and on you go home and you're a husband and a father how hard is that like an nfl linebacker they go home and they tackle for an hour you go on a 10-hour shift of of real life violence is it easy to turn off? Do you sit there and talk with Duke? Do you have to have him by your side all the time? Do you have to have are you or do you have to have company all the time? Are you are you good being alone, Ed? How do you deal with the turning it on and turning it off of having to having to be rough and around the edges and a tough, badass, six foot four, two hundred and fifty pound intimidating cop, but now you're talking to a six six year old and telling him, Hey, this is my buddy Duke and we're 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 really friendly. Like how do you how do you make that flick that switch it, it's just practice i mean I, it didn't happen overnight especially you know when you're when i was down that one you know i was just that that scud missile that i'd go after criminal i wouldn't stop until you know I, I got you but then you know that you can't be that guy when you're talking to a, a six seven eight year old you know little kid um, so it took practice, you know, I, I you, you got to get down on one knee and get to their level and, and you got to be soft and you got to be, you know, I use a lot of humor uh, in my presentations and social media. And that's, that's my, that's my, my fiery sword when it comes to dealing with the nice part of police work. The, that's what I use. I use humor to break that ice because, you know, uh, me walking into room, I, people can assume just by looks of, of what kind of person I am. So I have to use humor to kind of break down that barrier, that misconception of who I am. Um, but to, to flip that switch, it's just, it takes practice, you know, the, and luckily I live far enough away from Menlo Park to where it takes me, you know, depending on traffic, 45 minutes to an hour to get home. So I can decompress and I can sing to the radio or I can pet Duke who's in the back of the car, you know, and just reflect about the day. And I'm, uh, so thankful that my uh, significant other Jocelyn is also in law enforcement. Um, she started in uh, LA County. She was a deputy down there then moved up here. And now she works for uh, San Mateo County Sheriff's office. So she's been in uh, law enforcement. She knows what I'm going through. I know what she's going through. And there's sometimes I come home and she could tell instantly what kind of day I had. 
and she may just back off for a little bit or just give me a hug and say, you know, uh, we, we feed off each other on what kind of day we have. And then we want to come together and kind of deconflict what happened on our days and decompress. Um, I'm lucky that I have that uh, a significant other that I can come home to and she knows the job inside out. And, and um, now my son's in law going to be in law enforcement. So um, just having that, that, that base at home, you know, can be a life saver when you've had a crappy day and you come home and you can, you can just let it out or just keep it in for a little bit. And then when you're ready, you're, you're not talking to somebody that has no idea what you've done all day. What is the significance of the sleeves? The tattoos are addicting. I got one. It, it, my dad passed away in 2006, and I had to wait for my dad to die to get a tattoo. I had one put on my arm in memory of my old man, and my whole life I was disciplined, uh, and I was taught that tattoos are not classy of uh, you've heard when you do have tattoos visible to cover them up before you're a waiter a waitress a maitre d uh, somebody that's serving the public right or working at a store you're a cop you deal with people that are hell's angels to gangbangers to what you know people that have a lot of tattoos um you come in as a six foot four, 250 pound cop, you have sleeves. Is there significance that you wanted to fit in? Are you addicted to tattoos? Do each, I, I, I have a feeling that you're going to obviously each one of them means something probably throughout your career and your family and Duke and all of that. But why the sleeves? Why not a back piece or a chest piece or a rib piece that you can cover up? Why would a cop that when you usually have to cover up your arms, when you have sleeves, why? the cop want that and has it caused you any issues having that um well i do have chest piece and i have a full back piece so i'm probably running out of, out of space. <laughs> but um you know tattoos to me they, they of course they all signify um something i mean my left arm is uh, is basically a version of saint michael casting the devil down into hell uh, my right arm is the four horsemen of the apocalypse um my back piece is a memorial piece uh, my chest piece is more memorial piece for one of my partners that was shot and killed in 2006 by a gang member. Um, it's just, and I'm going to go back to what I said earlier in the podcast is we're just like you guys. We're just like everybody else. Um, we like things. We dislike things. One of my things is I like tattoos. I like to be able to express myself, you know, in the ink. They're personal to me. They mean something. Um, part of our policy is we have to cover them up and that's, you know, that's, that's one of our, the rules that we have to abide to when we're in uniform, um, we have to cover them up. I've never really in, since I've had them, I've had them for basically my whole career, never had anybody say anything negative. They're more of a, uh, an icebreaker, if you will, even now more so today that tattoos are just normal that, you know, they're, they're not, they don't shock the conscience of the community as much as they did maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, today it's just, you know, uh, it's harder to find somebody without a tattoo than it is or find somebody with a tattoo. Um, I've had, um, uh, in dealing with the gangsters and, and, and things like that, you know, uh, you, you get a little mutual respect by what you have in your ink and the way you carry yourself, the way you take care of yourself. Um, in the gangster lifestyle, respect is a big thing for them. Um, it really doesn't mean what the general public means of respect. Uh, they, 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 they see more of, they get respect by fear, but, um, I definitely didn't do it for them, but they, they, they encompass what they see. Okay. This guy's squared away. He's got some ink, you know, he, he, he's not that new guy that, that just came out of the Academy. So you, you can get that little level of respect just by showing up and looking a certain way. So, when you start talking about narcotics, Ed, do you have you served in undercover? I know that this is something that you can't talk about a lot undercover, but um, undercover is a huge part of narcotics. Is is do you have experience in that? And if you're undercover, the sleeves and that now all of a sudden, do you, my, here's the point to my question: If you're out in the community and you show these kind of visibles that you have on your body, it would be hard to ever go undercover right you could never like you probably could never be put in that position or compromised of a sleeve getting pulled up and somebody like noticing something on your skin so that would probably take you out of that element altogether 
Well, before I had Duke and my face was plastered all over Instagram and Facebook and things like that. Yes, I, I did work undercover. And uh, most of the times it wasn't in the city that uh, I was employed in. It was outside different jurisdictions I, w- I would do things in. I did a few things undercover work in our city. Um, but now in my, uh, in my career, now uh, there's, there's probably no way that I can do undercover work anymore. I haven't in a while. I let my guys do that. Uh, as a supervisor, you really don't go any, you know, undercover anymore. Uh, you're, you're the guy, you're the coach, and you're, you're sending players out to do things and, and making sure the plan is, is uh, executed and everybody's safe. So um, being a detective sergeant, uh, I'm more the, the puppet master, I guess, if you will, making sure things are going well. Um, too visible. My face is too, you know, too known in the area. My tattoos have been all over the news. So I wouldn't feel comfortable going in uh, undercover capacity now unless it was, you know, maybe in Russia. So if you need me in Russia, I can go to Russia. <laughs> but uh, no, my, my UC days are, are, are over. S- S- Do you, as, as a sergeant investigator, was there a time with Duke that you were just a canine police officer in a squad car and you would pull over a car and you get a notion that there could be narcotics in this car? Or were you the guy that would get called out to bring the dog? Run me through a daily deal of if you're not the the cop or the police officer that has intent of like, okay, they're not smoking marijuana in the car, so I don't smell anything. There's no booze evident. How does, how do you come about? Like, obviously you get the rundown from the dispatcher and they're doing background checks on these people and seeing if they got any priors or felonies or misdemeanors or charges or whatever. Now you sit there and you have to say, okay, well, there might be something in the trunk. There might be something stashed under the seat. You got to, how does it work? You have to get a search warrant. If you want intent and you think there's something in there, can you bring the dog in right away? If it is the dog, the search warrant to where if he smells, he or she smells something or gets wind of something, that's automatic intent that, Hey, we we can go in now. How does it work? So basically, uh, as a detective sergeant running both units, um, you know, in investigations, we do, uh, you know, the detective work after a crime is done and my investigators will follow up and do that. My street team, which is uh, called special investigations unit, they're the ones doing the narcotic. They do street enforcement. You know, they're the ones with the tack vests on They go out and, and They'll ride around in car, you know, unmarked cars and pull people over. Um, I'll get called uh, to a traffic stop that maybe that officer believes that there's there's something in the car. The guy's nervous. You know, he has priors for sales of narcotics or, or he's just acting kind of hinky. They can call me. I'll come over there with Duke and run Duke around the car just as long as my getting there and me running Duke around the car doesn't prolong the stop make it more of a, an arrest or than a detention. Um, you know, a, an average guy can write a ticket in maybe 10, 15 minutes. If I can do that search within that time frame, it's totally legal. And if Duke alerts on the car, the trunk, the engine, you know, the seam of the, the passenger door, that is our probable cause to go inside because he's trained, he's, he's certified through the state of California and another, you know, the California Narcotic uh, Cannon Association, he's dual certified in finding dope. So the courts see that as um, his nose is our search warrant. His nose gives us probable cause to go in there because he he alerted on that vehicle, giving us the authority to go in and search. And when you go in and, <clears throat> and search and duke alerts and you okay duke alerts you go on and search is it a hundred percent or does he has he ever missed he's uh, every fi- every alert that he's got he i've always found something because he to put it this way he and the way i would explain it uh under oath in court that he alerts to odor um they would ask oh so your dog alerted that there's drugs in this car my dog alerted to odor um there's been times and we even train this way to where um, he will alert basically if there was narcotics in there um, at some point in time, there's been times where he's alerted. We'd open up a cavity and it's, it's empty, but then we find out, yeah, six hours ago, there was a kilo in there. So he's alerting to that residual odor as well. Um, 
So I tell people my my dog doesn't find drugs. He 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 sniffs out odor of drugs. So he's a hundred percent on the odor. Yeah. So if you're in court and there's no drugs, but there's odor of drugs being in there, does the case get dismissed automatically? No. We would have to further. Um, you know, there's been times where he's it's been empty, but then we found uh, the guy with ten thousand dollars in cash. Duke will alert on the cash as well because there's narcotics on that uh, that cash. So if he, he's alerting to like let's say a void or an area of the car where we opened up, and yeah, there's a it's a void where drugs could have been placed. You know, we keep going to our investigative purposes and and we go and then we find. You know, the guy's got ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars in cash. Well, chances are he just dropped off that kilo or of meth or kilo of, of, of coke and got paid for it. And what the funny thing is that Duke, you know, you're handling those drugs, you're getting paid. Duke will alert on that currency because now there's drugs odor on that currency. We will seize that money and um, that it's funds derived from narcotic sales. So we, that's part of what we do as well. We also seize narcotics money and uh, that's a separate uh, case, the criminal case. And then you have a civil case that then they have to prove that that money didn't come from narcotic sales, that they got it from a legitimate uh, job or, or sale of something else. Um, we have to go through that. And then we get a portion of that. The state gets some, the city gets some, and then that money comes back as asset forfeiture, and we can use it for dare programs, uh, teach kids, you know, just to say no. And it goes that money goes back to the apartment, goes into a fund that we can use it for drug awareness. So during that stop, Ed, <clears throat> you said that Duke is not an apprehension dog, but he's a he's a canine narcotics dog. He sniffs odor. He alerts to odor. Uh, if that driver or a passenger takes off running and goes into the ditch and tries to cross the highway is duke automatically put back in the car or can he become an apprehension dog or and if not are there dogs that that do both that where that dog can just be released and go tackle that person as well absolutely so um you have to be certified um in either narcotics uh, detection bomb dog or apprehension so you, there's a thing called post police officer standard training that you have to pass a certification before you become a, uh, that particular canine. So Duke um, is just the, the dope dog. We also have a uh, canine in our, in our department now, canine Hardy, that's just an apprehension dog. So he's, he's not a nose dog. He's just an apprehension dog. To answer your question, if that dude started taking, taking off, I'd have to put Duke in the car and then go chase after him myself. Um, Duke you know, in the beginning of his stage of life, I did some bite work with him, but he's not certified through the through the state. So if I was to take Duke and maybe he inadvertently nipped at him or, or you know, bit somebody else, you know, we're liable for that. So he's, he's not uh, fully trained for that and he's not certified through the state. So I would have to put him up in the car and then go find and chase that dude or call, call the other canine to go out there and apprehend him. Ed, did you ever have to do that? Yeah, there's been times where I've had to put up Duke. And a lot of times when we roll out, we'll roll out with two or three, four guys in a car or in our SUV. So that gives me the luxury to where if that guy squirts off, that my guys are already chasing out after him while I put Duke back in the car, lock up the car, and then I can I can meet up with them or help pursue them. How so important how important is Duke is in great shape. You're in great shape. Aesthetically that's one thing but cardiovascular and strength and stamina is needed in this position you see some cops that don't look like they would be ready for that is that shunned down upon in law enforcement and should everybody look like ed soares when they are a cop not physically but i'm like you're in shape you take care of yourself you you work out you understand the the importance of this 
wouldn't every cop want to be in the best shape of their life in case this stuff went down? I understand there's different levels. Again, you get the homicide. You might not be running somebody down, but you got to stay up late at night. You got to, you got to have stamina. You got, you're, you're probably not going to have the best diet because you got to stop and get a quick bite. At a, it's like being a duck hunter, right? I'm going to go to Arkansas. I'm going to have some biscuits and gravy, um, but I'm going to spend the rest of the year trying to eat as clean as I possibly can because I know what's going to happen. I'm not trying to say or insinuate, Ed, that, that I've seen cops that don't look like cops but in a way i am and is that shunned down upon and should every cop be in the best shape of his or her life i'm going to answer that question on just how i feel you know when you come into law enforcement i think you give up the right to be out of shape i think you give up the right to um not look a certain way and this is just my perspective um you know, you have, you should look good in uniform. You should carry yourself in a certain way. You should work out. You should eat well because we're that, we're that thin blue line between anarchy and civilian. We have, we have to be ready at, at a moment's notice. And if you're not physically capable, mentally capable, you know, whether it's cardio or your strength to do that, you're not serving you. I don't believe you're serving your community at the best of your ability. Um, do you, you should be in, you know, good health to where you can have a full 25, 30 year career and not have a heart attack when you're 35, 40 years old, because you're overweight and you're, you're eating a Taco Bell Jack in a box at one o'clock in the morning. My personal thing is you have to respect the badge. You have to respect the uniform, look good, keep yourself in shape. Um, that's why I'm a big proponent on jujitsu. Um, I train jujitsu five days, five, six days a week at uh, a place in Redwood City, Peninsula Self-Defense under Jean-Jacques Machado. Um, that um, jiu-jitsu is basically, I think every cop should train jiu-jitsu because you're dealing, you're, when you train, it's unlike other different martial arts where if you do Taekwondo or karate or Jet Kune Do, you're, you're basically sparring and you're doing things. And I'm not putting down those arts, but in jiu-jitsu, you're grinding for an hour and a half, two hours, or you're actually rolling with somebody to where, you know, for six minutes is a normal roll to where they're trying to submit you, you're trying to submit them, you're trying to survive. There's pressure. There's, you know, there it's, it's chess. You're trying to figure out, you know, one or two moves ahead of them. That applies to, to law enforcement. It helps with your cardiovascular. It helps with your strength. It helps with your thinking. It helps with your mental capacity to solve puzzles. Um, and then when you get into a fight, it's not uh, where you're punching the guy and it looks bad on camera or you're coming out and you're tasering them or God forbid you have to take somebody's life by shooting them. You're able to control them on the ground gracefully, put them in a hold or, or keep them safe, yourself safe or them safe. You know, for an extended period of time, because that's what you've trained to do, you know, five, six days a week, a couple hours a day. Um, I think it, it, it bridges that gap to where an officer can be in shape. And then if something happens, be able to handle himself, you know, gently with, with the art of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and jiu-jitsu is, you know, mind, body, control, understanding your, your, your muscle awareness, um, your muscle memory, how to counter. Like you said, it's a chess game. He or she does this, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to be in an arm bar, or I'm going to be in a chokehold, or I'm going to be in a triangle. Like, I, I, I've seen, you know, I've been around it enough to know what you're saying. And I, I one thing you didn't mention, though, which I think I want to make sure, because I know, I know that I'm asking a lot, is – the responsibility to your partner and your force too. Like you don't want somebody, you don't want somebody having your back that's not prepared or not in shape or that's not going to be able to run somebody down or, or their heart rates at 190 and they're hyperventilating and they can't keep their gun straight. And I'm not saying that people are out there doing this. I'm just saying that I would want partners that I know have been training their mindsets right their focus is right they're clear they're transparent they know their body they know how they can run they can they have stamina you know all of that is going to go into uh you know the, the 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 responsibility of making sure that you're backing up your partners in the right way as well 100 percent. yes you're absolutely correct so I, I just was, you know, I was wondering like a guy like you that takes so much into consideration of your body and your health and your mind and jujitsu and diet and nutrition and mental focus and, and, and you 
yoga and uh, uh, therapy, you know, mind over matter therapy, like really meditating and getting to know like all this stuff when you're 20 i i wish i would have been like man i, I wish i would have went to rio de janeiro and got into all these jiu-jitsu classes and got into all these meditation classes and there are people that do it you know there are but you know everybody's raised it for it differently you know we were brought up in baseball and hunting so you know that's naturally what we gravitated towards so there, there's just that's what i love about life and podcasting and learning stories of like man look at all that goes into this you can meet somebody and be like hey i'm a sergeant and i got a dog named duke but when you really break down somebody's substance and the thread count that they've been sewn with you're like man look at this this is complex there's a lot that goes into being a cop for 20 years and being safe and being able to protect people and being able to do this and there's there's there, there's a part of me that almost feels like a lot of times when i talk to military or law enforcement i'm like man i kind of feel like i'm not doing enough you know like we should be doing more like I should be a cop or I should be in the Navy. I should be a SEAL or a Ranger or Delta Force or a Green Beret or something. But then when you talk to you or you talk to military personnel, they're like, no, everybody's got their own path in life. This is what I chose to do. Um, we can do our part in supporting the blue line and, 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 and being a part of, you know, events like we were in Vegas and becoming friends and hunting together and, and doing our part to support. Uh, but there's always that part in my brain, Ed, that's like, damn it, man. Like I'm just, I'm just a duck hunter, you know, like I'm a good father. I am a good son to my mom. I get that, but it's like, man, professionally, I'm just a duck hunter. I'm not out there serving or protecting or, but I can do my part in other ways. And I get that but sometimes i ask myself is that suffice is that really enough so i, I kind of play chess in my mind of like damn and i wonder if 46 46 is too old to get into the precinct and, <laughs> and become a cop you know what i mean it's like i think email, about I'll, it i'll email you an application i'll expect it back by the end of the day what's that i'll email you an application um i will i would like to do a ride along i mean i it's like it's I've had the hardest time getting the camera crews cleared. It's like, do you want them in there? We have insurance We're We're signing off on it, but it's like, they don't want it televised. I'm like, well, I understand. So I'm trying to find that right fit. Um, I have several conversations going on in Nevada, California, Idaho, Oregon of trying to find the right fit. Cause I really want to do, I want to tell law enforcement stories through what we do because a lot of law enforcement officers male and female hunt so i i, I want to be able to tell maybe me and you could talk off record of maybe maybe you have some ideas on that but duke's five and a half how many <clears throat> would you answer this i, I know you're going to be honest but the legalization of marijuana you're a narcotics officer California, I believe maybe maybe it wasn't the first state, but it was one of the states leading the legalization of marijuana and then mushrooms. And then I, the laws that have been coming out of that state just literally get like, I, I got to come up for air once in a while and just be like, yeah. Are you, really, this just happened. Um, but again, if you're not willing to get in there in the city council or the government and try to change it, like who am I to say anything? I, all I can do is vote or, or t talk to people and educate them on what our views are without getting on a soapbox and saying, you got to vote Republican, you got to vote Democrat. Like, um, has it changed the drug war? Has it made it more acceptable to be, you know, have marijuana, uh, being able to go into a dispensary and buy weed right here where I live, there's billboards, get an eighth of an ounce for 25 bucks. Like I, I I've been telling people this and it's so, it's such a metaphoric state of mind. When I see COVID dispensaries, they back in the day, it was car pulls into a driveway or a parking lot, rolls the window down. A guy with his hoodie on or a mask comes up and hands him a bag of weed or a bag of Coke. They get some money. They leave these dispensaries now these cats that work there are in masks they have their pads they're coming out to a car with the window rolled down ed taking the order for marijuana or gummies or cbd or whatever cdb or whatever it is cbd cbd then they're going in they're getting the drugs they're coming out and handing drugs through a window that's halfway up and then they're taking the money in a mask and i'm like that's exactly how it was back during it's just so 
funny to me. Like it's, I'm not saying the drug war is funny or humorous. I'm just saying like, look at what's going on with COVID. They're doing drug deals through windows with masks on again. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> has it changed at all the legalization of marijuana? Has it made, has it changed anything in the war against drugs and narcotics and what you see? You know, coming from when I started, I can remember where I would book somebody into jail for having, you know, under an ounce or, or a marijuana joint, you know, and now it's so mainstream. Duke is still certified in marijuana because it's still a crime to sell it on the street. And it's still a crime federally. And we're task force officers, uh, deputized U.S. Marshals, um, and can enforce federal law. So when we work federally and I use Duke and, you know, with the FBI or DEA, he still has to be trained because, you know, you're stopping, you know, huge traffickers that are putting tons and tons you know, through different counties, but it's still, even though it's mainstream and even though it's almost 100% legalized, there's still criminal elements that are making money off of it, that are still selling it at the street level because, you know, it's maybe cheaper to get it from the dude on the corner of the street than go to, you know, the next city and buy it from a dispensary. We're constantly getting calls for drug rips to where guys are selling, you know, a pound of weed off Craigslist or my, or Snapchat. And they meet up and they get robbed. So there's still that violent aspect of does marijuana still bring out violence? And in my opinion, it still does. And it still needs, even though it's legal, there's still the criminal element that are making money off of it. And they're running around the strap with guns. You know, they, they got, you know, pounds and pounds of weed. They're running you know, through, through different jurisdictions, they're not doing it legally. They're not paying taxes on that, 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 you know, pound of weed or, you know, we don't even know what they're, you know, it's regulated through, through the cannabis clubs, but you're buying it on the street. What's it laced with? Is it laced with fentanyl? Is it laced with, you know, PCP? And so there's still that element of it's still out there affecting the community, even though people think it's, you know, it's, it's legal and it's, and it's harmless. There are still criminal elements out there that are working, you know, behind the scenes, you know, killing people, hurting people, putting bad product out there. So you still need cops and you still need dope dogs that can smell that because they're still out there doing dirt. So should it have been legalized, Dad? Is that a question you can't answer? Because I would never make you answer a question, but <clears throat> I just I mean, don't. I, I mean, are there aspects that marijuana has that are beneficial? Absolutely, 100%. I have family members that have severe illnesses that use edibles to keep from uh, feeling pain because they don't want to take, you know, Norcos or Oxy. Um, do I think that there's a benefit um, that marijuana brings to cancer patients and things like Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not so narrow-minded as a cop that I can't think outside the box that, yeah, it's, it's helped people. But I'm not saying just because I believe that it has this beneficial, you know, it's beneficial to people with cancer or severe pain or, you know, going through chemo and they're using it to get their appetite back. Absolutely. One hundred percent. I say go for it. But what I don't like is the, you know, the criminal element that are not doing it the right way. And, and they're bringing violence within the community because they're selling it the wrong way. And because they're not, you know, acting in the, under the guise of, of the lawful uh, business, you're still getting, you know, you can still make money off marijuana on the streets. There's criminal elements going to do that. So um, I think if it's used correctly, it's 100% to, that I believe that it helps people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to continue this in a part two. I want to get more updates on some of Duke's stories and some of his highlights. I want to know more about Duke's diet and it does he train <clears throat> like a world-class athlete now a lot of people look at a duck dog like we have and we forget sometimes they're just dogs they're still a dog they're still our buddy um we ask him to do a lot um they chew up a baseball and you're like really you're a master hunter you're not supposed to do things like that. that's not the case right they're still a dog they still have those tendencies and those instincts does he still pee on the floor once in a while? i want to know more i want to get more into duke i want to get more into his diet and what you can do was provided for him and i also want to get you know i want to hear some some stories of what's going on 
with you know with some of his stops and some of the experiences that he's had at five and a half years old i hear dog years got reduced a little bit i don't know if you read that article that they don't it's not a seven multiplier anymore but they're saying like a five and a half multiplier now so really duke's about duke's in his mid-20s so he really he should be in his prime of yeah. his athletic career like jumping over you know jumping over a cadillac to get to into the other door when he sniffs something so i want to hear more about that but man i appreciate your service ed thank you so much for being on the podcast and um you have any closing words at all just thanks chad for for you know you said something that are you doing enough you know should you be a police officer what you're doing just a simple act and i i know that you know i follow you on instagram and, and see all the awesome things that you do you help every day and in this bringing a face of law enforcement or, or the things, you know, bringing up what I do and what thousands and hundreds of thousands of other police officers do on a daily basis, you bringing this to your podcast and shedding light on it, that's serving your community just as much as me going out and, and arresting a bad guy. So I applaud you. I'm honored that you, you asked me to become on your podcast and I will most definitely come back for a part two. Heck yeah. We're going to do part two. I will uh, be back with you in one second. That's Ed Soares, Menlo police department, investigator, Sergeant K nine Duke narcotics, absolute badass Doberman pincher. I've met Duke in person. I have pictures with Duke. I have cards and coins. I do want to get some other uh, merchandise, some more merch from, from yet. I'll talk to you about that off camera. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here for another edition of the Foul Life Podcast, Yukonuba Duck Dogs podcast series fueled by the one and only Yukonuba. For more information, you can find them all over social media at Yukonuba Sporting Dog on Instagram. Their sport diet is what we're feeding right now, but they got the work diet. They have several new diets in the works. Their, their science and their research is second to none. I've been to their facilities. I know what's going into these diets and we swear by them. I'm looking at Axel right now and he is ready to go. We're going on another duck hunt the day after tomorrow on Friday. So wish us luck on that. For more information, you can follow us at the Foul Life TV on Instagram, thefowllife.com. We have brand new brand, The Provider Life, happening right now over on Instagram and theproviderlife.com. Our new seasonings and rubs will be launched in about 30 days. Our cookbook is in the works. We couldn't be more excited. Check out all of our brands. Info at thefowllife.com if you want to send us any inquiries or have any requests for guests or topics on upcoming episodes of the Foul Life podcast. This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast and our brand new podcast series, Where the Payment Ends, hosted by Clay Belding, Clint Belding, and Alex Crosby. Big game, turkey hunting, predator hunting, ballistics, rifles, muzzleloader, archery, trapping, conservation, you name it, you're going to hear it on there. Tune in, Where the Payment Ends. I'm Chad Belding, your host. Tom, hit that button. This is 2AM Logic. The song is called My Foul Life. Life.